what I'm going to essentially center on is for the trillion things to exist, to come into play and to, and to do something useful for us, they have to work separately, together, automatically, and resiliently. And we'll talk about what each of those means in this context. But let's start, first of all, looking at what exactly a trillion things is and how that fits in in terms of technology gaps and the way forward. So, so the first obvious point is a trillion is a big number. Really, who knew? But the key is not actually the number one trillion so much as the concept of scale. So back in the, the, the restaurant days, the, when I was working in a restaurant, we learned that if you double a recipe for cookies, you can have two batches of cookies, and that works just fine. If you make 100 times the recipe, it doesn't quite work out that way. You've got to adjust things, and you've got to do things differently when you scale. And that's really something that we'll see coming up, that when you build a trillion-scale internet, you're really going to have to think a lot about what that means in terms of both the scaling and the growth. Uh, again, just to give you an idea of how big this number is, a typical newscaster will read a thousand words in a five-minute newscast. That, to get to a trillion, you need a billion of those newscasts, and that takes about 6,000 years to read. So there's, it's a big number. It's a million millions. Which leads to the question of, are there a trillion things at all? If you're going to have a trillion thing internet, are there a trillion things to begin with? Um, there are, if you start with, if you start including con consumables. So for example, there are 400 billion beverage cans made every year. So if you had connected beverage cans, you could get to 400 billion quite quickly. You might ask yourself, why on earth would you need a connected beverage can? But you know, hold, hold that thought. <laughs> So we started thinking about this and thinking, okay, if you're going to have a trillion, a trillion is big, what actually does that mean? Well, if you, if, if you thought about a trillion sensors, and they all had a lithium coin cell, how much lithium is that? Well, it turns out it's a lot. <laughs> it's 109,000 metric tons of lithium. So that's about three years' worth of annual production. And that's assuming that, that Tesla doesn't want to build any cars and that nobody wants a laptop, that you're going to put all that lithium production into building coin cells. So that suggests that maybe you'd need a different kind of battery. And if you look at some of the other popular batteries, nickel metal hydride and so on, you find that they have limiters as well. There are rare earths involved in them. So that brings us to the observation that if you're going to have a trillion thing internet, you're going to really need energy harvesting. So just thinking about the scale leads us to some interesting observations. Another thing we were thinking about is, could you have a trillion chips? And, and this one actually turns out to be easier. So if you take a sensor chip, and we've made a few of them in, uh, in ARM research, and they're, they're typically a couple of square millimeters of silicon. If you start multiplying that out and take into account yield numbers and blah, 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 you get to around 28 million wafers needed to produce a trillion chips. Now, that's about triple the annual capacity of TSMC, but it's only about 30% of worldwide production, so it's something that we can certainly do. So that, that, that's good, and we don't need any of the, the fancy spintronics to make these. We could make these things in 65 nanometer CMOS. So that's helpful. One of the, the facts I learned that I did not know before is that when you're talking on that scale of wafers, you actually measure the quantity in million square inches of silicon. So to put that in perspective, a football field is around 7 million square inches, and it doesn't matter whether it's American football, Canadian football, European football. It's, they're all roughly the same size. So that's good to know. The next question is, if you're going to have trillions of things, where are they? What do you do with them? Where do they exist? And really, when you think about it, they're going to exist primarily at the edge. So that's where you, you have a trillion objects, connected toasters, connected houses, connected beverage cans, whatever. There's, the trillions are there. They then communicate to some sort of gateway device or a wireless, you know, your phone or whatever. And then those, in turn, communicate to the cloud. As you move from left to right in that picture, the numbers go down by sort of a factor of 100-ish each time. And that means that we have to look at Trillion volume is over in the edge, but not only that, the communication bandwidth becomes interesting. 
So when you, you have these trillion things and they need to communicate basically wirelessly to the next node along, there's only so much bandwidth. There are actually physical limits to the amount of bandwidth and to the amount of signals you can transport and the energy it takes to do that. When you move to the next level, going to the, from the gateways to the cell network or whatever, the, in addition to the physical limits, there are also regulatory bandwidth limits and re, you know, license spectrum and so on that you need to deal with. In addition to that, there are energy limits throughout the entire system, and there are dollar limits every which way as well. So there's, there's a lot of constraints on this, and we need to think about those too. A common question that comes up is, all right, you're going to have a trillion things. What are they going to do? The easy answer to that is, if any of us knew that, we would be building them and you know, becoming billionaires. But, we, we do know that there are a lot of opportunities out there. So, you know, disaster management we've seen, unfortunately, quite a bit lately. But in addition to that, there's industry, home, and so on. And it's not really that there's a shortage of opportunities for the trillion things, so much as there's a shortage of people to do the designing for it. And let, let's look at what that means. If you take, for example, the, the total number of people in the world who are RF designers, there's maybe 5,000 of them. And you can argue this, you know, the RF designers that I know all agree that there's one RF designer themselves, and then there are other people who are not so good. <laughs> but when you look at that, there's each of these 5,000 people, if you're going to have a trillion things, they're kind of responsible for 200 million devices. So that there, there's definitely a shortage of RF engineers versus a trillion devices. When you go to IC design teams, the numbers are a little bit better. There's maybe 20,000 design teams worldwide. That gives you sort of a 50 million scale. But think of the diversity of applications on the previous slide. In order to achieve that diversity, there's a huge variety of things that you have to do. And that's where you have to look at the, the coders of the world. So there are maybe 20 million people out there who can write code. That means that if they're doing a trillion things, there's only 50,000. There's a lot of diversity. The diversity of the trillion thing internet has to come from software designers. And that leads us to two possibilities in hardware space. Either there'll be a set of platforms that are configurable to a wide variety of applications via software, or alternately, we create a future in which hardware design is a lot more like software design so that coders can build it. Both of those are possibilities, so we can, we can think about that too. The next thing we think about is what exactly does the IoT do? So this is how the IoT works. There's really only one algorithm with just variants on it. Essentially, you have sensors someplace. The sensors gather some data, they do something with it, and then they send their results up to the cloud somewhere. Meanwhile, over in the cloud, the cloud gathers data from lots of sensors. It does, again, some kind of processing, and then all of that processing goes into doing something useful, getting some information, learning something, or with the optional actuator, controlling something. So you have a sensor that or sensors all over this room. They tell you what the temperature is. At some point, something decides whether it's going to turn on the air conditioning or not. The, the blue parts in this are, are places where there's an opportunity for machine learning. So keep that in mind as we move forward. All right, so with that background, let's look at what it takes to make the internet work with the trillion things in it. They need to work separately, together, automatically, and resiliently. Let's talk in turn about what those mean. So by separately, what I mean is if you're going to have things, they need to do something useful. So if you have a humidity sensor, it doesn't matter how well connected it is and how brilliant its interface is and how many standards it follows. If it doesn't actually work as a humidity sensor, you don't want it. So that means that when we think about designing each of these nodes, we have to follow a variety of constraints. Functionality is one, but energy is another. When you think about the energy required to operate a sensor, there's not a lot, whether it's a battery or a harvester or whatever. You have to go through this list of you know, constraints and deal with all of them. You have to think about the application software layer. You also have to think about the process technology and you have to think about libraries and work your way up. All of these things matter. Looking in more detail at that, let's take a very small amount of energy. So 100 picojoules, what can you do with that? Well, you can run a Cortex-M0 for 10 cycles. So there you go, you get 10 cycles worth of execution. 
you can also write some amount of memory, and that ranges from a small amount with flash to a little bit larger amount with SRAM and so on. Or you can broadcast this across some interface and send it somewhere. You could either send it to a local memory or you could send it to a radio someplace. But in each case, you, you have a trade-off between the amount of computation you're going to do, the amount of communication you're going to do, and the amount of storage you're going to do. In some cases, it makes sense to store data. In other cases, it's more energy efficient to recompute it later when you need it. So all of these things are important. And then, of course, there's the uh, how far can you drive your electric car, and the answer is not very far. So good to know. So things need to work separately, but they also need to work together. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at a piece of political wisdom from my uh, 19th century political boss in Boston. Don't write if you can speak. Don't speak if you can nod. Don't nod if you can wink. Just minimize communication always. So let's look at that. And this depends on application. In a passive system, so an airbag sensor, for example, there's not really a lot of communication that happens either from the sensor to the outside world or from the sensor to its environment. It's a fairly, it's fairly constrained problem, constrained amount of sensor data. When you get to something like a blind spot indicator, interactive intelligence, there's a little bit more. There's a radar thing that's happening. There's a little bit of processing happening. There's, there's tracking and matching with video and so on. When you get to autonomy, on the other hand, now you've got a whole lot more bandwidth, a whole lot of communication that has to happen. So different systems in the trillion world are going to be constrained in different ways, and the amount of communication versus computation trade-offs are something that you really have to consider. Let's look at a good example here. So this is a, this is a pictures from a camera that sits up front of my house. And you buy these things, and they have motion sensors on them. So you'll notice from the picture, there's a whole bunch of leaves and there's a whole bunch of shadows. And that's what the front of my house looks like. And motion sensors say, oh, leaves. The leaf, we, the leaf moved. The shadow moved. Leaf moved. Shadow moved. Doot, 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 doot. It thinks there's motion happening all the time. But on the other hand, so there's this huge amount of data, megabits per second of data coming along from this camera. But the only information that I really care about is things like, oh, my grandson just walked out the door. That seems like a useful piece of information. Or the UPS guy is coming. That's a good piece of information. Or Godzilla is attacking the camera, which turns out that's actually a moth attacking the infrared sensor. So <laughs> there you go. Useful things from video cameras. But, but the key point here is that we're dealing with this massive amount of data, but there's really not very much information. Can we do this processing locally? Can we minimize the communication and help these things work together better? So that's really where we want to go. We also need this internet to work automatically. And if you think about that, let's think about where that comes from. So here's a quote from J. Paul Getty. If you can count your millions, you're not a billionaire. I don't know about you, but I've never really had trouble counting my millions. <laughs> Hasn't been a problem. <laughs> Nonetheless, if we, we update this for the future, if you can count your billions, you're not a trillionaire. A trillion, as we established earlier, is a lot. And so we're going to have to have machines solve those problems. So if machines are doing things, let's take a look at now at what machines are good at. So what's the sort of problem that machine learning does well? First of all, it's important that the solution can be graded objectively. It's important that there's a lot of data available. It's also important that it's difficult to describe the solution with conventional programming, and it would just take too much effort to do this by itself. So, so image recognition is the classic problem that, that has kind of enabled the machine learning revolution. But image, image recognition definitely has a solution that can be graded objectively, but the, the objective nature of it is contextual. So for example, is this a picture of a frog? Well, yeah, it is. Here's a frog. <laughs> it's also a picture of a bird. So there's a bird. Is it a picture of food? Well, maybe if you're looking at birds eating, it's a picture of food. So there is an objective answer, but that act answer is context dependent. But again, the point is that this kind of automation can be applied throughout this IoT system, and that will allow us to gain volume, gain scale, and make progress. Let's look at some of that. So here's an example of 
why you don't need a data center to run a neural network. So this is a, a guy named Matt Rubashkin came up with this. It's train spotting on a Raspberry Pi. So his particular problem was he wanted to know when Caltrain was arriving at the station. The Caltrain website was not too helpful in that. So he thought, well, let's, let's set up a camera and we'll take pictures of the track and then we'll find out when the train is coming. But similar to my leaf problem, he has to figure out when is it a train, and if it's a train, is it a light rail, a Caltrain, or a freight train, and when is it just a truck going by? So he implemented this whole thing, and he built this system that frame by frame analyzes it. It's built off the, uh, the TensorFlow from Google. It uses the Inception v3 image network. It's quite a clever thing. So th this is a neat system that he built. It runs on a Raspberry Pi. It's, but when we think about it in our trillion scale internet, could this be simpler? Could we do it some other way? And the answer is maybe. So, so watch this space there. This has also got to the point where you can try it at home. So I thought, well, he can spot trains, I can spot kids and UPS people. So what I did was I took the same methodology that, that Matt used and I applied it to my camera. And I trained it on 400 images of bushes and 100 and something images of people. After I was done, I ran it on some other data, and I found ambiguous pictures like the two that are up there. So it wasn't sure whether a crow was a person or not, and it wasn't sure whether my daughter running out there really fast was a person or not either. So I retrained it again on some ambiguous Im images, and now I've got it up to about 90% or 99% accuracy. So that was good enough for me. I decided I would stop there because I'm lazy. But if you were less lazy, you could probably get it better than that. All right, so where do we go to next? The next thing we get to is resilience. It's important when we think about the, this internet that it be able to respond to problems. And the reason is, is sort of encapsulated in this quote here. So if, programmers, or if builders built buildings the way programmers wrote code, the first woodpecker that came along would destroy civilization. Now, that, that quote was from 40-ish years ago, so things have gotten better. Programs are more resilient than they used to be. But the, the concept is the same. We have to remember that in the trillion thing world, one in a trillion events are important. One in a billion events happen a thousand times. So we have to make a system that is able to deal with woodpeckers and lightning and so on. When you think about things that fail in an, in an internet world, there are real consequences to it. So the, the picture of the uh, centrifuges there is an example of the, the Stuxnet virus caused these things to vibrate at their resonant frequency and essentially self-destruct. So in addition to woodpeckers, there are actually malicious people out there trying to cause trouble as well. We, if we have safety critical items like tools, locks, power, you know, and so on, all of these things need to be designed resiliently. They need to accommodate not just security issues, they need to accommodate failures, they need to accommodate wear out and so on. So the, the resilience has to be built in throughout the system. All right, so where does that leave us? Remember, we have these four key points. So things need to work separately. If you have a humidity sensor, it needs to be a humidity sensor. They need to work together. The communication between them is important. Managing the energy of that communication is important. Managing bandwidth limitations is important. They need to work automatically. When you have a trillion scale internet, there's too much of it for people to do. The machines have to handle it on their own. And finally, it needs to be resilient. So where that leaves us is the solutions that we make don't have to be perfect but they ideally need to be invisible to users. And by that, what I mean is that the trillion scale internet just really won't happen if things just don't work. So that's where I'd like to leave you. Thank you. <laughs>